Imagine giant oil platforms out in the middle of the vast ocean, far, far away from any land. These colossal structures are built tough, like superheroes, to battle the wildest ocean storms. The folks on board, like the brave crew of the Ocean Ranger, trust that the platform is super reliable. But sometimes when the crew isn't trained well, the design isn't great, and the weather goes crazy, even their trust can't rescue them. The Ocean Ranger is a self-propelled, semi-submersible offshore drilling rig working in an area called the Grand Banks. It's owned by an American company, Ocean Drilling, an exploration or Odeco for short. It's chartered to Mobile Oil Canada, who own the drilling rights for Hibernia oil field. Mobile Oil Canada is a subsidiary of the American company Mobile Corporation at the time it's built. It's the world's largest semi-submersible platform. The rig weighs almost 25 tons. It's 396 feet long, 362 feet wide, and 337 feet high. High, making it as high as a 30-story building. Of course, when it's floating almost a third of that is below the waterline, it floats on two 400-foot-long pontoons that lie 80 feet below the waterline. These pontoons have ballast tank compartments that can be partially filled with seawater. This helps to stabilize the rig in rough seas. It's capable of drilling in ocean depths of 1,500 feet. The Grand Banks lie in the North Atlantic Ocean, 166 miles east of St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada. It's known for its rich oil and gas reserves. It's also known for its severe weather conditions, particularly in winter, and the ocean depths in the area range from 100 feet to 600 feet. On the morning of the 14th of February, 1982, 84 crew members aboard the Ocean Ranger receive weather forecasts that predicts a severe winter storm is rapidly approaching the Grand Banks. The storm is linked to a major Atlantic cyclone. This time of year, the region is often subjected to extreme weather events. And this incoming storm is forecast to be particularly powerful. The Ocean Ranger is designed to weather such an extreme storm. The rigs previously withstood harsh conditions, leading the crew and the rigs operators to have confidence in its ability to handle this storm. The crew of the Ocean Rangers start to prepare for the severe weather standard procedures, involve securing any loose equipment, checking that all weathertight doors and portholes are sealed, and ensuring the stability of the rig by managing its ballast tanks. The ballast control system is critical in maintaining the rig stability. It regulates the amount of water in the ballast tanks located beneath the rig, allowing the rig to adjust its buoyancy and stability in response to the sea conditions in preparation for the storm. The crew check the system thoroughly. Even though they start making these necessary precautions, there's no immediate cause for concern. They know the rigs weathered these storms before, despite the expected severity of this storm. Regular operations on the rig continue as the evening sets in. The storm reaches the ocean ranger, high winds and towering waves dwarf the immense size of the ocean ranger. It's designed to handle winds up to 100 knots and waves up to 110 feet high, but this storm is proving to be extraordinarily powerful with waves that go beyond the rig's calculated limits. At 1900, a rogue wave hits a nearby rig. The Sidco 706, which is also operated by Mobile, the wave damages deck gear and washes away a lifeboat despite the deteriorating weather and increasing sea state. The Ocean Ranger continues its drilling operations. The crew have faith in the rig and the culture of the offshore industry is that interruptions to operations are avoided at all costs. However, the conditions are becoming challenging. The crew have to navigate the rig in the stormy weather, working to keep everything running smoothly and safely. This requires constant monitoring of the rig systems, especially the ballast control system that is crucial to maintaining the rig stability in the turbulent sea communication with the shore also continues reporting on the rig status and the evolving situation. This commitment to continuing operations in spite of the declining weather conditions goes to show the level of confidence they have in the Ocean Ranger's design and capabilities, or perhaps their fear of reprisals for abandoning their station. In 55 to 65 foot waves batter the ocean, Ranger, a rogue wave slams into the Ranger just past midnight. This rogue wave is significantly larger than other waves in the storm which are already pushing the ranger to its calculated limits. The wave strikes with such force that it shatters the glass of a porthole window in the ballast control room, the nerve center responsible for maintaining the rig stability. The porthole is only 25 feet above the waterline. With each subsequent wave, seawater pours into the room through the broken portal. 
This room is filled with the electronic equipments and control panels that control the ballast tank systems, with seawater flooding the control center system. Start and malfunction almost immediately. The seawater causes significant electrical shorts within the system, leading to the malfunction of key components in the ballast control system at 2100. The Setco 706 radio operator picks up radio communication on the Ocean Ranger, describing how valves on Ocean Ranger's ballast systems appear to be opening and closing on their own. The crew can't control the rigs list and trim, and it becomes progressively more unstable, while the crew try to manually control the ballast. The storm gets worse and more seawater pours into the control center without the ability to properly control the ballast tanks. The rig starts to list or tilt towards the front of the rig. This means that as the rig rides into the oncoming waves, its bow is riding lower into each subsequent wave, which pushes it further into the water rather than riding up and over the oncoming waves. Water starts to flood the forward chain. Lockers in the corner support columns, the crew operating the bat control have several disadvantages. Water is wreaking havoc with the automatic control system, but they don't have the proper training to know how to manually control the system. They don't even have a manual to look up how to override the automatic system and take manual control that might not matter anyways. The bow dips. It forces the stern higher out of the water. The ballast control pumps are in the stern of the vessel as the bow sinks and the stern rises. The ballast pumps don't have the power to pump water up such a long incline, and out at the stern the degree of listing increases with every passing hour. The crew begin to implement emergency procedures. These are sets of predefined actions designed to regain control over the rig stability and prevents a complete disaster. They unsuccessfully try to manually control the ballast tanks, they halt all drilling operations and prepare for a potential evacuation. They shut down all non-essential systems and operations on the rig in order to focus all resources on crisis management. They share the drill string and cut away from the blowout preventer, something the deep water horizon wasn't able to do. While the crew are experienced and they've been trained for emergency situations, the combination of a severe storm malfunctioning equipment and a listing rig creates an exceptionally challenging and dangerous situation at 0052. The Ocean Ranger makes a mayday call standby support vessel Seaforth Highlander is requested to come in close Canadian Coast Guard and mobile operated helicopters are alerted. Hospitals in St. John's are put on standby the support vessels Bolton Tour and Nordator the standby vessels of Sidco 706 and Zapata Euclid are sequestered by the Canadian Coast Guard to provide assistance in an emergency situation. Coast Guards have the right to take control of a vessel at sea in the support vessels approaching the ocean. Ranger are experiencing the same winter storm as the Ocean Ranger high winds, rough seas, and poor visibility create dangerous conditions that limits the ability of the rescue teams to reach the ranger they must navigate through the violent storm, reach the increasingly unstable ocean ranger, and then evacuate the crew in extremely challenging conditions every minute counts. Aired 0130 Ocean Ranger transmits its last message. There will be no further radio communications from the Ocean Ranger. We are going to lifeboat stations. Abandoning any boats in the ocean is a big decision today. The rule of thumb is that you step up onto your life raft, which means your boat has already sunk beneath you. But to evacuate an offshore oil rig adds several dimensions of complexity. Gathering essential survival gear, ensuring all crew members have life jackets and readying the lifeboats for evacuation, all while a rig is tilting. Abandoning the rig is the last resort for the crew. It means leaving the perceived safety of the rig and facing the harsh elements of the storm in a lifeboat. It must be terrifying to climb off a huge vessel that's been destroyed by the storm and climb into a tiny boat that by comparison is the size of a bathtub. These preparations are taking place amidst rising panic and confusion with the crew acutely aware that their lives hang in the ballot. Lifeboats are designed to be launched even in extreme conditions, but the severe list of the Ocean Ranger makes it extremely difficult. The crew struggle to launch them against the tilts of the rig. The intense wind and the monstrous waves, the rig's lifeboats are designed to use a gravity drop system and so the rig needs to be relatively level for them to launch the crew. Manage to launch at least one. Lifeboat, the Seaforth Highlander sport vessel, arrives on the scene. They can see bodies floating in the water. A lifeboat with eight or nine men approaches them. The lifeboat steams across the stern and pulls alongside their port quarter. The Seaforth is able to throw lines to the life raft before they can bring anyone on board. The life raft is battered against the hull of the Seaport Highlander and collapses the men in the water cling to the lifeboat, which remains overturned. The Seaforth fights its way through the swell and wind to reach the men they slowly succumb to the cold. Only one man is seen wearing an orange survival suit 
the Seaforth maneuvers into position and narrowly misses chopping him up in its propellers. The crew on deck throw a grappling hook to try and pull the man onto the boat it hooks his life jacket, but the man slips below the water line. It's simply not possible to pull men from the water in such rough conditions with the equipment and deck setup they have rescue teams from the Coast Guard merchant vessels, supply boats from other oil rigs aircraft, and helicopters descend on the scene rescue workers battle against towering waves, freezing temperatures and powerful winds as they search for survivors. At 0230, the first rescue helicopter arrives on the scene. Captain Mike Clark, the pilot of the search and rescue helicopter from Gander Lower Search and Rescue Technician Master Corporal Randy Brown from a 24-meter cable into the freezing water, and Howling Gale to try and retrieve the first man they see, he's already dead. Snow and waves estimated at 16 meters make their efforts impossible. It's the first and last airborne rescue attempt. The conditions are too dangerous flying over the search area. Rescue helicopters fight against winds approaching 90 miles an hour. The heavy seas make body recovery impossible. Captain Clark instead tries to guide the support vessels to bodies in the water. It quickly becomes clear that the supply ship are having to fight for their own survival. Sending men out on deck to recover bodies is a suicide mission. A rescue helicopter lands for refueling on another rig. The rig is pitching violently in the heavy seas. The helicopter crew becomes seasick to the point they have to abandon the refueling and return to their base on land. The rig's severe list deteriorates until it reaches a critical point where the rig is no longer stable. The ocean ranger capsizes and sinks below the waterline. The search and rescue operation turns into a recovery operation in the days that follow debris and personal effects from the ocean ranger wash up on the Newfoundland coast. Even though hospitals in St. John's are on standby, not one patient from the Ocean Ranger is admitted. All 84 crew members aboard the Ocean Ranger are lost. Only 22 bodies of the 84 crew are recovered. They're brought to Year 17 in St. John's Harbor. Newspaper reporters are held back so that no photographs can be taken. A Russian trawler mechanic Tarasov sinks in the same storm. The bodies of the Russian seamen are brought to the same pier. Ranger crew members were asked to check the Russian bodies to make sure no men from the Ocean Ranger were accidentally sent to Russia after the storm has passed. Sonar and underwater ROVs are used to locate the wreckage of the Ocean Ranger on the sea floor. The rig lies in water around 100 feet deep. It's decided that this shallow depth poses a hazard for marine traffic, and so the rig will be refloated and sunk in deeper water. A European company is given the contract to salvage the rig. During these operations, two divers are sent to recover fuel from tanks in the pontoon. They cut into the pontoon using a cutting torch gases from the fuel ignites, creating an explosion, killing the two divers. Another diver is killed a week later when a large piece of metal debris falls from the salvage ship and crushes him against the sunken rig, bringing the total death toll of the Ocean Ranger to 87 men foreign.